Ed Penton posted this tweet today, um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, Pope Francis on Saturday blasted Catholics who hewing the old school versions of liturgy like the Latin Mass have made an ideological battleground of the issue, decrying what he described as devil-inspired divisiveness in the church. So I'm just going to read through this uh, article here and then I'll make a, a small commentary on it. Audience with teachers and students of the Pontifical Liturgical Institute. Today, in the Vatican Apostolic Palace, the Holy Father received in audience the teachers and students of the Pontifical Liturgical Institute on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of its founding. The following is the Holy Father's address to those present. Dear brothers and sisters, good morning and welcome. Thank you, Father Abbot Primish, for your introduction. Your Italian has improved. It is good. I greet the Father Rector, the Father Dean and the professors and all of your dear students and former students of the Pontifical Liturgical Institute. I am happy to receive you on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of its founding. It came about as a response to the growing need of the people of God to live and participate more intensely in the liturgical life of the church, a need that found enlightening verification in, in Vatican Council II with the Constitution Sacrosanctum Concilium. Your institution's dedication to the study of the liturgy is now well recognised. Experts trained in your classrooms promote the liturgical life in many dioceses in very different cultural contexts. Three dimensions clearly emerge from the conciliar spirit of renewal of liturgical life. The first is active and fruitful participation in the liturgy. The second is ecclesial communion inspired by the celebration of the Eucharist and the sacraments of the church. And third is the impetus to the evangelization mission, evangel evangelizing mission, starting out from the liturgical life that involves all baptized persons. The Pontifical Liturgical Institute is at the service of this threefold need. First of all, training to live and promote active participation in the liturgical life that in-depth and scientific study of the liturgy should encourage you to foster, as the Council wished, this fundamental dimension of Christian life. The key here is to educate people to enter into the spirit of the liturgy. And to know how to do this, it is necessary to be imbued with this spirit. As Saint Al Ansem, at St. Anselm, I would say this is what should happen to be imbued with the spirit of the liturgy, to feel its mystery with its ever new wonder. The liturgy cannot be possessed. No, it is not a profession. The liturgy is learned. The liturgy is celebrated. To reach this attitude of celebrating the liturgy and one only participates actively to the extent that one enters into the spirit of celebration. It is not a question of rites. It is the mystery of Christ who once and for all revealed and fulfilled the sacred, the sacrifice and the priesthood. Worship in spirit and in truth. All this in your institute must be meditated on, assimilated, I would say, breathed in. In the school of the scriptures, of the fathers, of tradition, of the saints. Only in this way can participation be translated into a greater sense of the church, which makes us live evangelically in every time and in every circumstance. And even this attitude of celebration, so, celebrating suffers temptations. At this point, I would like to understand the danger, the temptation of liturgical formalism, going after forms, formalities rather than reality, as we see today in those movements who try to go backwards and deny Vatican to itself. In this way, the celebration is a recitation. It is something without life, without joy. Your dedication to liturgical study on the part of both professors and students also makes you grow in ecclesial communion. Indeed, the liturgical life's life opens us up to the other, to the nearest to the fathers from the church in common belonging to Christ. 
rendering glory to God in the liturgy finds its counterpart in the love of the neighbor, in the commitment to living as brothers and sisters in everyday situations, in the community in which we find ourselves, with its merits and its limitations. This is the road to true sanctification. Therefore, the formation of the people of God is a fundamental task for living a full ecclesial liturgical life. The third aspect, every liturgical celebration also always concludes with the mission. What we live and celebrate leads us to go out towards others, to encounter the world that surrounds us, to encounter the joys and the needs of many people who live without knowing the gift of God. The genuine liturgical life, especially the Eucharist, always impels us to charity, which is, above all, openness and attention to others. This attitude always begins and is founded in prayer, especially liturgical prayer. And this dimension also opens us up to dialogue, to encounter, to the ecumenical spirit, spirit, to acceptance. I have briefly dwelt on these three fundamental aspects. I emphasize again that the liturgical life and the study of it must lead to deeper ecclesial unity, not division. When liturgical life becomes something of a banner of division, there is the odour of the devil. The deceiver is there. It is not possible to worship God and at the same time turn the liturgy into a battlefield for issues that are not essential or indeed for outdated questions and to take sides. Starting from the liturgy are on ideologies that divide, that divide the church. The gospel and the tradition of the church demand that we are steadfastly united on the essential masters and in sharing legitimate differences in the harmony of the spirit. Therefore, the council wished to prepare abundantly the table of the word of God and the Eucharist and to make possible the presence of God in the midst of the people. Thus, the church without liturgical prayer belongs the work of Christ in the midst of the men and women of every age and also in the midst of creation, dispensing of grace of a sacramental presence. The liturgy must be studied while remaining faithful to this mystery of the church. It is true that every reform creates resistance. I remember when I was a boy, Pope Pius XII began the first liturgical reform. The first one, you can think water before, you can drink water before communion, fasting for an hour. But that's against the sanctity of the Eucharist. They rent out their garments in despair. Then the, the Vespers Mass. But how come Mass is in the morning? Then the reform of the Easter Triduum. But how is it possible on Saturday the Lord must rise? Now they postpone it to Sunday, to, to Saturday evening. On Sunday we don't ring the bells. And where do the twelve prophecies go? All these scandalise closed minds. And also it also happens today. Indeed, these closed minds use liturgical matters to defend their own viewpoint. Using the liturgy, this is the drama we are experiencing in ecclesial groups that are distancing themselves from the church, questioning the council, the authority of the bishops in order to preserve tradition. And the liturgy is used for this. The challenges in our world and of the present moment are very strong. The church today, as always, needs to live the liturgy. The council's fathers did a great job to ensure that this was the case. We must continue the task of being formed by the liturgy. The Blessed Virgin Mary, together with the apostles, prayed, broke the bread and lived charity with everyone. Through their intercession, may the liturgy of the church make present today and always the model of Christian life. I thank you for the service you render to the church and I encourage you to continue in the joy of the, of the spirit. I bless you with all my heart and I ask you, please pray for me. Thank you. So there you have that discourse by Pope Francis and I just thought it was very interesting when he says there is the order of the devil, uh, deceiver is there, the banner of division and so forth. Um, and he's quoting Sacrosanctum Concilium. I suppose, yeah, let's quote Sacrosanctum Concilium. Uh, for example, nevertheless, steps should be taken so that the faithful may be able to pray or sing together in Latin, those parts of the ordinary of the Mass which pertain to them, Sacrosanctum Concilium, overwhelmingly voted by the Council Fathers. That's what. Use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. Uh, 
In accordance with the centuries-old tradition of the Latin Rite, the Latin Rite is to be retained by clerics in the Divine Office. Don't know any cleric that prays the Divine Office who is not in, in the traditional movement. Could be wrong, but I don't know of anyone. In the Latin Church, the pipe organ is to be held in high esteem. We've just removed the pipe organ from the Adoration Chapel in Knock for its a traditional musical instrument that which adds a wonderful spender to the church's ceremonies and powerfully lifts up lift ups man's mind to God and to higher things. I mean, I think the division here in the fact that we have to understand we had Sacrosanct Concilium, the document from which the Novus Ordo was developed from, but the Novus Ordo that we know today, the way which we worship today in the church was not discussed in Second Vatican II. They discussed using the vernacular. They didn't discuss what, how we practice the faith in, in the church today. It simply wasn't discussed. So anyone who comes along and says, look, uh, just because I go to Latin Mass, I'm against Vatican II. I, I always go back to them. Show me what we do in Mass today. Show me where in Vatican II they discuss this. Show me. Point it out. Show me where in Vatican II, in which document in the Second Vatican Council does it say we have to treat the Eucharist with disrespect, that we don't need to bow to the Eucharist anymore, we don't need to kneel to the Eucharist anymore, that we need to remove kneelers from our churches like they did in Claret Monastery in Belfast, that we needed to remove our sanctuaries, that where in Vatican II does it say we need to take out our altars, you know, remove altars, put tables instead, which we've done in so many parishes around Ireland. You know, where in Vatican II does it say that um, Latin doesn't have to be used at all in the Mass because in most Masses in Ireland you never hear a word of Latin. Maybe the Kyrie lays on it, but that's actually Greek. But most, most Masses, not a, not a single word of Latin, not no connection at all to the language. Um, so I could go on and on and on and on about the liturgical abuses that we see in the church. And these liturgical abuses are what are driving people to the traditional Latin Mass. Once you're conscious, once your mind understands what is the Eucharist, it's, our, it's the body of our Lord. Uh, the Mass is the worship of God. It's not about, it's not, a, it's not a, like an entertainment on a Sunday. It's worshipping God. The division hasn't, it's not the, the traditional movement that's causing the division in the church. It is the liberal movement. It is the, the people that have destroyed the mass, that have destroyed the Novus Ordo. And I keep saying this, and I'll say it till I die. If priests and bishops across the church had taken the Novus Ordo and said the black and did the red, and for people who don't understand what I'm saying, say the black and do the red. When you're reading a missal, you'll see um, text in black. That's the text you say. And then you'll see text in red, which is what you do. So, for example, if you have to bless, if you have to, uh, if you have to open your hands, whatever. I, I mean, I was never a priest, but that's what you will see in a missal. You will see black text and red text. If priests did the black and said the red, the divisions in the church wouldn't exist. But we've turned it into a a, 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 a light entertainment, a clown mass, a God knows what, and it's com continuously evolving. And it doesn't tie back to Sacrosanctum Concilium. I mean, if you went in and ordered it a Novus Ordo Mass, you would say, well, why are you doing that? Where in Sacrosanctum Concilium does it say that? I mean, we go to Mass here in Balaná and... Uh, they don't even follow the Novus Ordo. The, the, the people don't know how to follow the Novus Ordo. They don't know when to sit, when to stand, when to kneel. Uh, it's practically kneeling the whole time during the day. It's very bizarre. Um, and so forth. It's, that's because people aren't educated. So I'm not going to reject Second Vatican Council. It goes way above my pay grade. I'm not a priest. I'm not a bishop. Not for me to start arguing about Second Vatican II. But what I can do is I can argue about what wasn't in Second Vatican II. That is present in the liturgy today. You can argue there. And that's not causing division. That's pointing out the, the realities of the destruction of the faith. And because we've destroyed the Mass, we've destroyed the faith. Once you destroy the Eucharist, 
Once you destroy that connection that a soul has to the Eucharist, there is no faith left. It becomes intellectual, it becomes academic, it becomes entertainment. And you might go and you mightn't go. And you see this when people go to a wedding mass or a funeral mass, that people that don't normally go to mass, they don't know the responses, they don't know what it's there. So, I mean, uh, I mean, we don't, we, we, we've all seen it. That's not division. That's division that the church themselves have created, that bishops and priests themselves have created. It's not the laity that have done this. We see it now. The world is seeing this now, in the last two years, because, you know, priests and bishops have stopped saying mass during COVID, during those 666 days of restriction, said, now go home and watch it on television. And guess what? People started sharing the traditional Latin mass. And a lot of people that remember it from their childhood are saying, well, I remember that mass and I'd like to go back to it now. And there are people that are still watching traditional Latin mass at home. They haven't gone back to parishes in Ireland. I know people, elderly people, haven't gone back to the Novus Ordo after COVID. They'll watch traditional Latin Mass online and when they can, they will travel to a traditional Latin Mass. That division hasn't been caused by the tradition movement. The tradition movement has been there for the last 50 years saying traditional Latin Mass. That division has been caused by those who have weaponized the Novus Ordo for their means. It's... And we all know what, what, what we've done. You know, we, we see it in the Novus Order today. I remember going to Switzerland and going into a parish and there was six or seven different masses. Um, we have the Portuguese mass and we have the Italian mass and we have the German mass. Obviously, Switzerland is a multilingual country, understandably. And when you create the mass in vernacular, you have a multilingual You have to offer it in different languages. You have all of these different masses, whereas... You know, 40 years ago, maybe the priest would have said the homily in the vernacular, but the mass would be the mass. It would be in Latin. Everybody would have understood it and know it. So the division we've created, we've created more division now than we have in the past, in my opinion. So, you know, what am I saying here? I would love if Pope Francis sat down with faithful laity from the go to traditional Latin mass and understood our views, dialogued with us had questions and answers, spoke to us. Instead of saying, saying every time we hear something about the traditional movement, the Pope is, and it's not the first time he's used this, he's using, the, it's, diamo, it's diabolical, it's demonic, blah, blah, blah. That's hurtful. That's very, very hurtful. That is really hurt. I mean, to hear that is hurtful. Of course, you're going to have the odd, stupid idiot that's going to say something dumb and, you know, paint the traditional movement in a bad way. You, I mean, you, you have them on every, pla every place. That's not what, what most of us are wanting to do. Most of us want to go and give reverence to God, to give praise and worship to God in the most beautiful, silent, reverent, sacred way possible. Do you know what I mean? That's what we want to do. And it's not dividing the church. It's us and having experienced the Eucharist in that way. Because... You know, I had gone to the Latin Mass in the Novus Order for many years and I thought I knew, I said, okay, the Novus Order in Latin and the, and the Old Mass, they're nearly the same. They're not, they're not. When you kneel down for, for communion in traditional Latin Mass and you enter into how the Eucharist is given, how, because it's, it's, it's different, uh, it really is a profound experience. You understand what reverence, what catechesis we're giving to our kids. It's beautiful. Um, and so it's, it's really painful when you see these headlines. It's, it's kind of, it, it, it jars with you. I said, that's not my experience, Holy Father. I'm not looking to create divisions. The divisions are here. Look at your church. The majority of baptized Catholics don't go to Mass. That wasn't caused by... Um, Catholics going to traditional at Mass. Archbishop Lefebvre didn't cause the collapse in attendance at Mass, did he? Did he? Honestly, ask the questions. Like, we, we have to be sincere and say, did the traditional movement cause the utter collapse in the attendance at Mass? Because this whole project, this Bugnini project, doesn't seem to be forced during an increased participation at Mass. And I really hate when people say, oh, when you go to traditional Latin Mass, Catholics are not participating. B.S. 
BS. I'm sorry to say that. That is not true. Catholics going to traditional Latin Mass are very participant, are very actively participating in praise and worship of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the purpose of the liturgy. Do you know what I mean? And where is you know, the missal? You go to Mass. This is the it's a, it's a it's a it's a French missal that I that I found in the it's a French Latin missal that I found in the bin in Bayonne in France being thrown out. People going to traditional Latin Mass, they have their missal. They're following the Mass. They understand the prayers. That's participation, isn't it? Or am I wrong? To say that we don't participate, the traditional movement doesn't know how to participate in the liturgy. You know, we created this three-year cycle of liturgy, this three-year cycle with all the readings, and I have nothing against adding a sacred scripture to the Mass. Absolutely nothing. If we wanted to add the second reading, so, f- so great. But, but I, I, I really do question when, when most Catholics now in Ireland barely go to Mass on a Sunday, we have to ask what's going on. I mean, so I'm not questioning the, I'm not questioning Vatican II at all or Sacros- Sacrosanctum Concilium documents. Above my period, not a theologian, not going to go there. I'm questioning the realities on the ground as a layman of what we have done to the Mass. And that division in the church didn't come from traditional movements. That division came from those who weaponized the Novus Ordo for their own means. And we all need to, we can just look at Cardinal Marx, what he is using that the Mass for. The Mass is for baptized Catholics. Every baptized Catholic goes to Mass. We don't segregate our the attendance at Mass to specific groups, should we? Is that is that where the church is going now? <laughs> you know, the division isn't caused by traditional movements. The division is caused by those who have weaponized, utilized the, the mass for their own means. Like I've seen it here. I've seen I've seen it so many times. You go down and you see some charade going on, like the Archbishop of Armagh at Christmas with the dancers around the liturgy. Where in Sacrosanctum Concilium was dancing at Mass? Um, disgust. It wasn't. Where in that institution Rome was dancing in Ireland discussed. And people could say, well, in, in, in Africa they do it. We're not Africa. We're Europe. We're the Roman Rite in Europe. It's never been part of our tradition. So, um, you know, the division in the church, the Pope seems very focused on the traditional movement. And we seem to be forgetting the division is those who don't even care about any mass and don't bother going at all. That's the true division. And you have to ask why? Why have they gone away? Why are they not bothered? Why does the Catholic Church in the mass mean absolutely nothing to millions of Irish people anymore? Millions. Because millions of people couldn't be bothered with mass anymore in Ireland. On a Sunday. We know this. They don't bother. It doesn't mean anything to them. It's and if they do bother going, it's you know it's a month's mind. It's a, a funeral or a wedding. You know when you can you you know it's the the granny that calls me. Well, look, I have a month's mind for granddad next month. Make sure you're all around here. That's might pull some people into church. That's basically it. <laughs> so you know um, I do have to take exception with the Holy Father. You haven't dialogued with the, the laity. You've called a synod, a synodal process. After you issued Tradiciones Custodis, maybe the synodal process was the time to discuss that before. Have a survey of the laity who goes through traditional Latin Mass. Why weren't we surveyed? We weren't surveyed. We weren't even consulted. A few bishops responded, and we didn't even see the responses of the bishops or what the bishops had to say about it. It's incredibly sad, to be honest. It's sad because the Holy Father doesn't want to experience what many Catholics are experiencing. And I go to both Masses. I go between both communities and that's why you can see because I'm not, I don't do what the Society of Supplies 10 says to only go to traditional Latin Mass. I go to both because I think we're called to be united. I agree with the Holy Father that we have to be united. But we also have to call out the destruction of the faith. No? 
that's my view anyway, you have to call out when you see the faith being destroyed, when you see the Eucharist being destroyed in the Mass. Say, no, hands, hands. Do you ever you go up to the communion now and, and if you kneel to receive in the tongue, the priest says, hands. That's what, the, that's what happened to me last Sunday. Hands. I said, oh, yeah. no, I said, I'm, I'm only, I only receive kneeling in the tongue. Okay, come back afterwards. <laughs> that was precisely right. Or you're not even given communion. You, it's looked like you're being protesting. It's being ideological. I don't protest at Mass. I don't protest. I received the communion as I received it from St. John Paul II in Rome. As I've always done. That's how I received the communion. If that's protesting and being divisive in the church, then I will die on that cross for being divisive when it comes to the Eucharist. If it was good enough for me to receive kneeling and on the tone from St. John Paul II on Easter Vigil in Rome in 1995, it's good enough for me to receive in the parish. And the church hasn't come out dogmatically saying that you cannot receive communion kneeling on the tone. It hasn't. Yeah, so if we don't stand for the Eucharist, what would the next generation think of us? If we're not passionate about what we believe in, what would the next generation think about? Mm. Anyway, it's just my thoughts. I don't want to rant too much, but <laughs> I just want to, to put that article out there, what uh, Edward Penton had posted. And yeah, we'll see where we go. Anyway, God bless. Take care. Bye bye.